Hello and welcome to today's seminar. Um, Cambridge Central Asia Forum is delighted to have Professor uh, Hanifi. Um, I met him in the summer and we had a lovely discussion about um, Afghanistan and uh, I thought it was very relevant for our audience today um, in our course and otherwise in the university to hear him. Uh, so Professor Hanifi is at James Madison University. He has a PhD from the University of Michigan. He did his undergraduate from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, his research interests include Afghanistan, the Persian world, colonialism, nationalism, nomadic societies, Islamic urbanism, animal and environmental studies. Um, uh, he's published uh, a lot and it's very uh, interesting and he continues to do that. So thank you very much. And um, today he's going to be talking about the speciality of Afghanistan. Um, so since we've already delayed the talk today, I'm going to hand over the floor to Professor Hanifi. Thank you for agreeing to come today. Thank you very much, Prajakti, and everyone involved in the, uh, the technical wonders that have just sort of occurred to bring us together here. It's great. I'm a, a little reluctant to um, not uh, to stop sharing my screen. So. Um, I'll just say a few words here with our advertisement, uh, for which I'm very grateful to be participating in this uh, this seminar. And um, you know, um, when Prajakti and I had the great pleasure of meeting, I think in in May, um, our discussions were kind of on the contemporary political side of things. But I uh, should be clear in broadcasting my intent to kind of engage, I guess. Uh, the tools we use to discuss Afghanistan in the present, but I'd also like to impose some current uh, research interests in environmental history um, onto our subject matter and take a more of a long-term deep history kind of view, um, combining a concern with, for example, animals and water, rivers and mountains with more contemporary uh, concerns, let's say, about uh, identity politics and ethnicity in particular. So um, I should say, uh, in a sense, then, what I'll be trying to do with um, the concept of space is asking some larger questions, maybe, uh, about the politics of knowledge production regarding Afghanistan. And I should be really clear up front, in my view, um, much of the knowledge produced about Afghanistan has not been beneficial to the Afghan people. In fact, the Afghan people have been sort of the victims of a lot of this knowledge about Afghanistan. And I am interested in uh, trying to bring knowledge about Afghanistan to sort of assist and improve the lives of ordinary Afghan people. So knowledge of and for Afghan people, um, not for others is kind of what I'm interested in. Uh, and really with environmental history, that's what I'm trying to do. So um, in general, I should also be clear that I, I really um, appreciate the opportunity to speak here, but I don't wanna be considered a, a, an expert by any question about Afghanistan. I think the um, idea and the kind of commodification of expertise about Afghanistan is a problem in its own right. And I feel that I still have you know, far too much to learn about Afghanistan to be considered an expert. And I think the Afghan people have a lot to teach, uh, teach me still and us all. Um, and I just want to prioritize their positionality in our discussion. Uh, and again, there's no uniform Afghan people voice that is uh, what I'm sort of drawing attention to here. Um, so then let me um, start by posing a kind of general question. Um, and that is, where is Afghanistan? I, we all have to kind of, um, deal with this location and positionality. And if I was to ask um, the audience, I'm sure I could get a lot of answers. You know, perhaps people using GPS would give me longitude and latitude and things like that. But I think primarily um, what I would hear is things about uh, references to Afghanistan being 
on the borders or the frontier or the margins or the periphery um, of other places, sort of other regions. Afghanistan's <clears throat> kind of marginality to various regional studies traditions around it um, helps explain some of the, you know, the architecture of the field of study itself. And, um, you know, we often sort of discuss Afghanistan as the sort of uh, fringe of something else, the Northwest frontier of British India or the Eastern Islamic lands or um, something like that. And maybe more practically, um, I would ask the audience, particularly those at Cambridge to say, where is Afghanistan programmatically at Cambridge? How do you get there? Do you need to go through a, a sort of South Asian studies program, Middle East studies, Islamic studies? How do you how do you really get your degree in Afghanistan uh, at Cambridge? And maybe this is a disciplinary thing. Maybe if it's archaeology, you come through the Middle East. If it's politics, you come through Islamic studies or history, come through South Asia. I don't know actually, um, but the point is. Um, Afghanistan doesn't have a firm institutional location anywhere, really. Um, it, it, it's kind of a scattered intellectual formation in some senses. Um, and, you know, I would kind of ask, um, what does Afghanistan contribute to the programs within which it is situated? Usually, again, um, if Afghanistan is to appear in a South Asian studies program, for example, it would not be the center of any, uh, you, you know, it would be a minor track of study. It wouldn't occupy a central position anywhere. And this is, of course, not to say that there aren't Afghanistan studies centers here and there and Afghanistan studies organizations here and there. But again, the question is, what are they doing? Who are they doing it for? Uh, what, what, what's the resource base? What's the sociology of knowledge about this? What's the professional kind of marketing component about the work that the Afghanistan Studies Unit does or whatever the case may be? Um, so, you know, I, I kind of uh, like us to think a little bit in general, maybe about the epistemology of Afghanistan studies and its kind of institutional architecture um, as we get going. And, um, you know, we can proceed. And uh, so th that's kind of one question, where is Afghanistan located R within area studies tradition or institutionally, you know? But I'd also like to ask um, some rhetorically for the audience, you know, what is, what is Afghanistan all about? What are the tools that are sort of deployed to discuss it? And again, what I would receive if I were to ask this question to each audience member is a number of different responses. Afghanistan is about this or that um, kind of thing. And I think a lot of the uh, agreement though with across it would be things like this. Afghanistan would be a place that you know, has a very uh, complex state structure, maybe a failed state, weak state. Um, it's a, it's a sort of a problematic state in, in some form. And sort of the problems or, or the weakness or the, the sort of uniqueness about the state is because of some sort of ethnic ethnicness. There's a real high priority on ethnic logics when it comes to understanding Afghanistan and its state structure. And here again, um, from my kind of perspective, um, about how knowledge is pieced together and it, it's sort of contradiction and fault lines. I, I, I have some problems about seeing Afghanistan as a place where there is a high premium on ethnic kind of domination even is a frequent invocation. Afghanistan is a place where an ethnic group dominates other ethnic groups within a failed state, weak state architecture. And I just don't see how uh, that works. I don't really see how domination routed through a state while the state is a failed set of, you know, kind of institutions and personalities, how this works. 
So what I would like to propose then is that while it is the case that ethnicity is invoked to understand Afghanistan, I would like to argue that there is just very little serious theorizing about ethnicity. Um, and this is rather ironic um, for reasons I'd like to explain in the sort of course of the talk and the lineage of Afghanistan studies through ethnicity. Um, but I'd, I'd like to keep that in mind that ethnicity is sort of highly valued, but not it, it, it's referred to all the time, but never really described what it is. It's it's a it's a uh, again I, I'll just call it a failure of theory. And what theory can do, and I'm not trying to advocate that theories are the way to see the world, you know, uh, always. And I think experience is different than theory, etc. But you know what they can do is help comparison. And Afghanistan, in generally, is kind of an isolated intellectual entity. It's not connected very well to these other traditions. And I think the, the lack of a lot of comparative work on Afghanistan is, is symptomatic of a sort of a weak theoretical architecture. Um, you know, um, so then I would, again, by way of introducing the field of Afghanistan studies, really like to um, say how fast changing it is as a field of study. In fact, over the last generation, 20 years, there's been some really, really impressive um, work done on Afghanistan in ways that indeed highlight a number of connections between the people in place called Afghanistan and surrounding regions. And I, I really, um, you know, uh, I'm very happy to see a, a number of colleagues, for example, um, helping to connect Afghanistan to kind of South Asia. A lot of early modern Persianate connections to North India and just fantastic work. I can think of Niall Green and a slew of students in this direction. There are, uh, again, I think a product of Cambridge, Ben Hopkins has done good work connecting kind of uh, Afghanistan's colonialism to British colonialism. Perhaps my work speaks in that direction as well. Over the last 20 years, I think of um, some wonderful work or generation or so, I should say, uh, for those working to sort of connect Afghanistan to Central Asian studies. I think of Robert McChesney, Robert McChesney's work. I think of Scott Levy's work, um, for example. Um, you know, I think connecting sort of Afghanistan to the Middle East, Faiz Ahmed has done work with Ottoman kind of constitutional influences. And again, slews of students dealing with um, Ottoman and Arab world connections. And um, this is all really great to see. But my point is that I don't think, despite all of this work in connecting Afghanistan to other regions, I don't think there's been a lot of systematic attention to the space itself and spatial relations. Um, you know, Afghanistan is sort of seen in relation to other places and that space itself is, is just not prioritized. Okay, so then, um, you know, when it comes to space then, once again, given Afghanistan's unique interstitial spatial disposition, I'm surprised there hasn't been a lot of spatial theorizing uh, about it. And I think of limited work by geographers such as Derek Gregory that kind of positioned the, the space of Afghanistan in a genealogy of, of violence and the war on terror kind of thing. Um, but, you know, uh, I, I, I don't see a lot of the type of critical geography, uh, Lefebvre and kind of Marxist urban analysis. I don't, I don't see a lot of that in any urban location. For example, if it was urban space that gets theorized, et cetera, I, I don't see any real work in that regard at all regarding the spatiality of Afghanistan. Um, so, you know, um, let, let's see if we can proceed. And if I was to ask where Afghanistan is, you may uh, be right if you directed me to the map and said, there it is. 
And I would say, well, that's fine and well, but this raises all actually more questions and problems than, than answers and solutions. This map is very, I've come to see it as very distortive of historical realities. Um, how this map came to be reflects a, just a wide range of imperial interests. How the map is used by kind of external actors in a way that gives them, let's say, free reign over the space. Um, at times, the people moving within the space are subject to sort of incineration from the air, depending on what regime of power is in place. And, you know, um, uh, this map really sort of eliminates the, the series of historical connections between regions. And um, I am thinking just far beyond um, this map. Uh, in fact, I think the map distorts a lot of history more than informs it. Um, and again, in the world of nation states, this is the way to understand uh, Afghanistan through an international state system. And I understand that, but um, I just think it's missing a lot more than it's providing. Okay, so we're back to the regular map. And if we were to start sort of um, discussing how Afghanistan is related to, let's just say, Central Asia, and Central Asian studies. And I don't claim any expertise in this regard, but if I was to look at Central Asian studies, I would see some sort of maybe dual epistemologies of Russian and Chinese sort of lineages. I would see, you know, um, a, a lot of work on uh, sort of Soviet nationality policy, for example, in Central Asia. Uh, the field would have a lot of Islamic reform and um, sort of Islamic politics of Central Asia. There would be a lot, I think, of information about equestrian cultures and pastoralism and the role of the horse cannot be underestimated. I think this is a very key, key element for understanding the history of Afghanistan, the kind of equine contributions of Central Asia. Theories of nationalism out of Central Asia. I don't think Afghanistan studies has done kind of uh, enough with those potentials in Central Asian studies. Regarding South Asian studies, um, I think there is, again, a, a very deep kind of Sanskritic epistemology here that brings in uh, the Rig Veda, for example, and this brings in the geography of Afghanistan in ways that are quite interesting. Religious developments with Hinduism and Buddhism directly affect Afghanistan. You know, um, I think of British colonialism and theories of kind of colonialism that Afghanistan has just not really benefited from. Let's say, for example, subaltern studies is a phrase I've just not seen applied to Afghanistan right off the bat. And this is striking. Um, I would just call this for right now the Iranian world. And of course, what we have here is a deep history of Persian uh, language, theories of kinship and ethics. And, you know, the it's irrefutable, the Persianate sort of components of this thing called Afghanistan, it, fantastically relevant. The Turkic components from Central Asia, the Indic components, I think um, all help explain Afghanistan. But the discussions have been sort of in single dyadic sort of nodes, not a system. And please forgive me for the following slide. Um, again, uh, the map itself closer up. This is how I see Afghanistan. As opposed to this, I'm thinking Afghanistan as, like this. That is a space bounded by the Indus River to the southeast, the Amu Darya River to the north, and sort of around the core of the Hindu Kush. So I really see the space of Afghanistan as this. And it is through those various regional studies tradition that Afghanistan is made a place or given its placeness. Afghanistan is placed in those 
regional studies traditions in ways that is very much tied to the map. And um, I just would like to um, recognize that when I say South Asia, that's connecting also Southeast Asia and the Indian Ocean. When I say the Iranian world or the Persianate world, that means also kind of the Arab world in the Middle East and Anatolia. And what we get then is a um, sense of the intersectionality. Uh, I don't have my intersectionality map, uh, but if you could have a series of circles for those regions, Afghanistan would be in the middle and it's the intersectionality of this space that I think could lend a theoretical helping hand to us all as we uh, try to understand it, okay? Um, and what I'd like to do for the next uh, kind of body here of, of the talk then is to go through the, uh, certain historical conjunctures that really highlight the intersectionality of the space. And this will be a much longer term historical sort of survey, um, but I, I think it could be useful to perhaps point us in some comparative directions and open up maybe some uh, kind of theoretical uh, possibilities as we move into the modern era. And this is a very fuzzy map of what would be the Indus Valley um, kind of civilization. And chronologically, what we're speaking of here is, you know, mid second millennium, 2500 BC roughly to maybe 1900 BC. But you can see very far to the north here, short to guy, Amudaria, this would be the geography of Afghanistan. And it's really important to note that the sort of uh, material resources, the lapis lazuli, for example, from the Badakhshan region is circulating widely, not just in the Indus Valley civilization, but all the way to Mesopotamia and indeed the kind of uh, Egyptian pyramids. Uh, King Tut, for example, Cleopatra adorned their tombs with lapis lazuli. And so I just wanna sort of highlight that the uh, marginality of a place like the space of Afghanistan for the Indus Valley civilization um, really brings uh, a much wider geography and extraterritoriality into play immediately. And, um, you know, uh, what's, kind of uh, next in terms of a chronological moment um, would be this movement of the Aryan people from Central Asia through the Hindu Kush into North India, the Punjab, where we can start tracking the, the history of Sanskrit. Um, and uh, once again, if we look at the Rig Veda as the uh, sort of uh, earliest Sanskrit text in the geography of the Rig Veda, really includes uh, areas of Afghanistan, the Kabul River, the Kubha River, uh, and, and later kind of Sanskritic texts, the, uh, Mahabharata and Gandhari for Gandhara, really kind of um, relevant. And the same kind of context here, I wanna highlight on the Northern sort of stretches of this space, the Amudarya River and Zoroastrianism with Zoroaster, some say born in Balkh, and the kind of high level of uh, kind of water prominence in Zoroastrian uh, sort of uh, Yasna liturgies and uh, Apurani goddesses is sort of water. Uh, and again, fire and water in both uh, sort of Vedic era religion and Zoroastrianism on each side of uh, the Hindu Kush, the space of Afghanistan really caught up in these uh, fascinating <clears throat> cultural and religious developments in, in Central and South Asia. I'd like to use this slide of Alexander to sort of capture a larger period 
um, including, of course, Alexander's presence about the third century BC, but really the post Alexander Hellenic and Mauryan Seleucid era here, uh, maybe third century to around the year uh, first century BC. And um, once again, what we have are some tremendous contributions. It, it, some say that the Greek wine god Dionysus is a sort of product of Alexander's encounter with wine cultures and Nuristan and the sort of uh, encounter of Alexander's army with the elephants of India bring a kind of landscape uh, uh, environmental concern into play here. And, you know, um, this opens up also the Afghanistan to a set of global set dynamics in new ways. And I just um, think this era becomes very important for, uh, again, just immediately subsequently. You know, it's just so important that Afghanistan forms an international boundary zone between two kind of regional empires. And in fact, Afghanistan is arguably sold for 500 elephants by the uh, sort of Seleucids to the Mauryans. The, the Mauryans get the space of Afghanistan more or less for giving elephants and elephant trainers to the Seleucids. And this starts a whole history of elephant warfare. And it's really fascinating um, to position the Aryans on horseback and the role of the elephant here um, in the political processes and the cultural processes that the space of Afghanistan is so intimately connected to. And um, again, this space of Afghanistan gets internationalized in inter-regional transnational ways around the first century AD with the Kushan Empire and Kanishka, the great um, Kushan leader who's kind of, um, again, uh, broadcasting his, his presence to the world using Greek on his coinage, just like Ashoka, the Mauryan king, is writing in Greek and Aramaic and leaving pillars in Kandahar. The, the space of Afghanistan is getting marked by the global system in these centuries. And the kind of cultural fluorescence of Gandhara sort of centered in the Peshawar, Kabul River Valley, um, just so important as a, a, just an artistic explosion of Hellenistic and Indic uh, aesthetic forms and, and sculptural styles, and not to mention scriptural developments here. Um, and, you know, if we were to just take a um, next big jump in a next kind of historical conjuncture, <clears throat> I would point to the Ghaznavids in about the year 1000. But um, I'd like to preface th this discussion with the idea of Islam and uh, Islam's presence as a whole and how it took shape for the centuries before the year 1000. Um, and uh, this brings Afghanistan into play in, in such interesting ways where the space of Afghanistan is, you know, in the, let's say, 7th to 10th centuries or so, really a domain of, of flourishing Buddhist cultures, a, a kind of Hindu political dynasty. And Islam is, is kind of in that mix. And it's a fantastic um, inter-religious set of uh, um, interrelations um, in the space of Afghanistan. And I'm speaking particularly of the Hindu Kush and again, a, sort of the discovery of Jewish uh, kind of Hebrew documents in the mountains of Gore recently speak to some fantastic cosmopolitan, uh, what Frederick Barth calls an archaic cosmopolitanism to this region. Um, and I uh, just think more can be done for it. And there has been some work on kind of the particular cultural 
uh, interactions, the work of uh, Deborah Klimberg Salter and routing uh, here is, and, and Max Klimberg, of course, really relevant. Uh, and just more could be done um, in my mind. And now the, the Ghaznavid Empire itself is just so uh, relevant for the space of Afghanistan, Ghazna being in, in the uh, you know, Eastern borders of the Islamic land, the Hindu Kush, uh, kind of between Kabul and Kandahar. And um, what it does is begin the systematic projection of Islam into, into North India in ways that the early Arab dynasties in Sin did not. And so what we start to get through the Ghaznavids is a, a series of real important intellectual exchanges regarding uh, a lot of astronomy and math and concepts of zero, an Indian concept that gets sort of Islamized and makes its way to the West. Um, this is a fantastic period for a lot of intellectual exchange. Again, El Beruni writing the first kind of ethnography, so to speak, of, of, of India. Maybe not the first, Megasthenes wrote a book on uh, India as well, millennia earlier, centuries earlier. But the point is um, that what is happening in Ghazna has real significance for the space beyond Ghazna because we get the birth of modern Persian in the space of Afghanistan here with Ferdowsi Shahnama. And this is uh, just cannot be understated the importance of, of this development. The importance of the markets of South Asia now kind of entering an economic uh, ecumenical sphere of Islam is uh, can't be understated either. Um, the materiality of these inter-regional transactions uh, needs attention and um, uh, fascinatingly we get the sort of uh, camel, the great camel hybridity between one and two humped camels uh, around this time and the banks of the Indus to help this global trade that Islam carries with it uh, through the space of Afghanistan. It's just absolutely fascinating. More kind of camel history here. Um, in a sense, Afghanistan is a space where it's Turkic, Persian and Indic influences, but the history of the camel, the horse and the elephant are really, uh, etched throughout those, those relations. And it's just absolutely relevant from an environmental history perspective to capture that. Um, I need to also express that this thing called Islam comes through, of course, the medium of the Arabic language, but Islam as a cultural formation begins to be packaged around Persian in ways that are uh, perhaps more relevant for our cultural concerns rather than religious concerns, perhaps. And the, 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 the Turkic kind of component here just yield Islam to be a really, again, hybridic Arab Perso-Turkic formation culturally that enters South Asia and it gets incorporated in ways with local cultures. Just, um, Again, Afghanistan is so much a part of this and this Ghaznavid period really ushers in the beginning of systematic, um, dare I say seasonal and annual migrations of people from the space of Afghanistan that we can begin to kind of through textual you know, sources, the, the term Afghan kind of appears here. It's a Persian term, it's important to note. Um, some argue the term Afghan has been previously etched in uh, let's say rock carvings in ways that uh, uh, in, in the Iranian plateau in ways that perhaps uh, uh, are separate from the textuality or the term Afghan appears in this context and it's relevant because the presence of people called Afghans into the space of Hindustan, North India, um, adds a really important extraterritorial dimension to the space of Afghanistan because the historical residual category becomes Pathans. And really the space of Afghanistan um, gets understood to be a space for Afghans, yeah. It's a space though where Pashtuns dominate and this sort of this third leg of a 
tripod of Afghan Pashtun Patan metonymy is sort of coming into discursive historiographical play here. And it's very important to sort through that uh, complicated historiography, just the terminologies here um, are, are absolutely relevant for you know, later po political and ethnic reasonings, but more for the cultural processes involved here. Um, this is an interactive, multilingual, cosmopolitan context that sort of belies the logic of contemporary nation states with singular people and singular places that is just such a problem analytically and politically, you know. <clears throat> What to say about the Mughal Empire? Um, uh, but, and I won't dwell on it other than discussing its beginnings, and that is Babur. It is absolutely essential that we do more to appreciate the presence of Babur in Afghanistan, where he makes his name before going to found the Mughal Empire in Delhi in 15. 26. The, the point here is that he's buried in Kabul because he loved Kabul. He fell in love with Kabul and wrote all about it in his biography, the Babur Nama. And that is an environmental love story in short. It's translated to English, accessible for students, um, originally written in Chagatai Turkish, but using the Persian script, another sort of legacy of Ferdowsi perhaps, gets translated into Persian later by his grandson Akbar and illustrated lavishly. But, and we benefit from those illustrations of the, the rivers of Afghanistan, the gardens, the animals, the plants, the flowers, the trees, the birds. And it, it's just uh, the climate, the smells, the tastes, it's just, beautiful. And that Babur is buried in Kabul, um, needs attention. And, you know, the, the question I'd like to ask is, while the Afghan state has invested in this grave uh, site, uh, Babur has not been nationalized in the sense that he's not become an Afghan. The, the, the sort of ethnic privileging of this thing called Afghan has excluded um, many other groups that could be entitled to this designation of Afghan in some way, and I think Babur is one of them. Um, I'd like to ask rhetorically, how is it that Babur has not been indigenized and made to be an Afghan and celebrated in ways that are uh, a bit more enduring, uh, uh, let's say, for the nationalist project, and I'll leave that for later. But the uh, presence of Babur in this space called Afghanistan, particularly Kabul, uh, needs uh, ongoing collective, collective attention to extract the full value. And of course, the Mughal Empire is astride the Safavid Empire, and of course, the story of Afghan, the space of Afghanistan. And it's important to note there is no Afghanistan. We may have the term Af Afghan, but the term Afghanistan does not appear until later. Babur kind of mentions the term Afghanistan, but it's a secondary geographic referent. Um, it, 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 Kabul is this space and Kandahar is this space. These are um, it's very important to note that Kabul and Kandahar are kind of exchanged between the Mughals and Safavids and this sort of uh, borderland frontier disposition of Afghanistan takes, takes shape during this early modern period and just fantastic um, uh, exchanges going on, uh, particularly with Humayun. His presence in the Safavid court of uh, Tahmasp and coming back to, to India, uh, and just the, the whole sort of Afghan dynasty, so to speak, of Sher Shah Sudi, and, uh, you know, just so interesting for the questions of Afghan nationalism. And I, I, I just do want to remind ourselves that in all of this 
study of Afghanistan, there's not much theorization of nationalism. There's not much theorization of colonialism, not much theorization of tribalism or ethnicity or how they interrelate. Tribalism, ethnicity, and nationalism. Ahmad Shah Durrani is the founder in uh, some ways of this thing called the Afghan polity, the Afghan empire that becomes Afghanistan. And it's just essential to note um, that there have been extensive attempts to sort of Pashtunize Ahmad Shah Durrani. Um, and that's a nationalist projection, a contemporary kind of 19, uh, mid 20th century phenomenon. Uh, Ahmad Shah Durrani, I wanna be very clear, is a child of the Indus River. He was born in Multan. The Punjab was like a center of his concerns. Uh, his, his, his maturation as a, as a, as, as a historical actor uh, takes place in Iran in the context of Nadir Shah Afshar. Um, Ahmad Shah represents a kind of Indo-Persian heritage for Afghanistan in, in ways just that are so, so relevant and so much more relevant, I think, than trying to graft an ethnic-ness to him. Um, there's no evidence of Ahmad Shah Durrani speaking Pashto. He hired a tutor to teach one of his sons Pashto. There's this sort of uh, arguable text, uh, his poetry, there, it's kind of uh, really a curious text and we can talk more about it specifically. But I, I just think there's a lot more um, that Ahmad Shah can do for, for our historical understanding of the space of Afghanistan if he's kind of de-ethnicized and looked at a bit more objectively as a transnational actor, you know, <clears throat> um, in ways that are um, kind of more relevant, uh, shall we say, uh, you know, connected in a sense to the histories of the Safavid and Mughal empire maybe uh, than this anything Afghan as it were. Um, his burial in Kandahar, uh, Kandahar as a space that he kind of chose as a political strategy is absolutely relevant. And there's a history of, of, of why that is the case, but that strategy, the emphasis on Kandahar is really relevant. I think that deserves maybe more spatial attention when it comes to Ahmad Shah and his fleeting uh, sort of empire in the footsteps of Nadir Shah Afshar. And again, the, the Turkic dimensions of, of, of uh, Nadir Shah and Ahmad Shah really require uh, uh, substantive, I think, uh, uh, ethnographic investigation. Let's, let's I, I will, I think we have scheduled Prajati, excuse me, did we have two hours scheduled here, but we want questions. And so can I take another 20 minutes or so, half an hour, 20 minutes for um, talking? Yeah. If we can do 15, that would be good. So we can have a nice uh, discussion. Oh, yeah, okay then. Yeah. yeah. I hear some, what, am yeah. I getting find instructions? No, 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 you're fine, you're fine. You have 15 minutes, go for it. Yeah, yeah, okay. So let me just try to be a speedy then. Um, this thing called ethnicity has has a epistemology, a lineage, and you know we can talk about the ancient origin of the term eth ethne and Armstrong's work and you know Anthony Smith uh, would, and we should I think kind of discuss this. But the point is, for our present purposes, we can draw a more sort of immediate genealogy to British colonialism in the modern era, particularly <clears throat> the work of Sir William Jones and um, his sort of prominence in the early colonial project as a uh, linguist who studied Sanskrit and Persian and came to develop what we know now as a theory of uh, Proto-Indo-European and historical linguistics kind of philology. He, he's a founding father of this discipline. Uh, Sir William Jones, uh, sort of brought Pashto uh, into the uh, sort of purview of the colonial enterprise. The Asiatic Society of Bengal, working with a number of local Indian languages, a Pashto text comes to his attention and he studies it and eventually 
four years later, writes a um, conclusion that this language called Pashto is worth studying. And it's sort of, it's worth investing colonial intellectual uh, resources into. And it's very important that Pashto gets kind of positioned with the Persian language and these people called Afghans and it's lost tribes of Israel, Chaldaic connections. And it's really uh, just a fascinating um, set of uh, hypotheses about the language Pashto and the people called Afghans. And um, what this does though, is speak to what's going on with Sir William Jones is he becomes a kind of lawyer and what he is doing is studying these languages to extract legal principles that the British used in their rule over India and the kind of colonial uh, sleight of hand where the study of these ancient Indian languages can afford them by their Orientalist linguistic expertise, this insight into the true rational original meaning of the Dharma Shastra and other uh, texts that can, a digest of Hindu law is what Sir William Jones came up with in his studies of Sanskrit. And this is positioned against Muslim. It's, it's the fact that Sir William Jones positioned Hindus and Muslims as separate categories for rule that you know, we can draw a straight line to partition in 1947 from this sort of structural move to separate Hindu from Muslim law in British India. And this kind of majoritarian minoritarian approach to ruling India, we can sort of run this through the Indian National Congress and Muslim League and electoral politics and putting sort of the right sort of uh, people on the right boards and the right places and what this sort of speaks to very quickly um, is how ethnicity became that framework for a majoritarian minoritarian relations in Afghanistan. I'd like to draw that link directly. Um, very quickly, the sort of story of British colonial engagement goes through Mount Stuart Elphinstone, who's important for the first sort of official diplomatic representation of the British to the polity, the kingdom of Kabul. There is no Afghanistan, by the way, it's the kingdom of Kabul. He sort of brings the space of Kabul into the British colonial mapping agenda. Kabul becomes the center of this Afghan polity. It's very important that um, epistemological centering of Kabul and the thing called Afghanistan. <clears throat> Elphinstone is important for positioning Pashtuns at the cultural and historic core of this thing called the Afghan polity. And this is, um, again, sort of an air result of Sir William Jones' logics about these languages and peoples. And it's really just such a fascinating, I've, I've written about it and I have a book on Elphinstone for those that are interested to spend more time. The Alexander Burns is such an important early actor because of his focus. Let me just say two things. One, the Indus, bringing the Indus River. Afghanistan is first brought into the colonial purview through the Indus River. And maybe, again, I have a book that discusses theories, political theories of trade on the Indus that Afghanistan becomes a part of. The first British army in Afghanistan that is decimated is the army of the Indus. And that's an indication of the prominence of the Indus and geostrategic reasoning about Kabul and the space of Afghanistan in relation to Central Asia. And, you know, um, again, uh, just the horse dimension, Alexander Burns is doing a spy mission delivering horses from uh, the, the English king to the Maharaja Ranjit Singh. And that horse kind of component here is so relevant for politics. Um, Again, the, the British boundary commissions later in the 19th century, really it's about the Oxus and that becomes a kind of international, the Russians are also mapping the Oxus River. And I just wanna highlight these two rivers as the sort of um, imperial space making concerns for what becomes Afghanistan. And again, mapping the Hindu Kush is also a big part of that. The Indus and Oxus and the Hindu Kush are mapped before Afghanistan is bordered 
after the second war. The borders of Afghanistan take shape from the late 1960s to 1890, 1860s to 1893. 1893 is the Durand line. And the rulers in Kabul are given subsidies for these borders that becomes a big sort of part of the architecture of the colonial political economy. The rentier state dependency of Afghanistan gets sort of structured here. And um, again, uh, what I would wanna do with the colonial period is speak beyond the three Afghan wars that I think are more misleading. They're generally, I don't even look at them as wars, frankly. Um, I think there's other ways to describe them uh, that are kind of more helpful. But the third Anglo-Afghan war in 1919 is so-called War of Independence, where the space of Afghanistan is now in control. The Afghans control their own space. It's no longer a sort of semi-colony, um, sort of princely type state type thing in the British, in the British model, 1919. And this really opens up Afghanistan to all kinds of uh, crypto colonial and further colonial developments. It's so important for the architecture of the state that uh, international actors, the French and the Germans um, in particular, become very active in the French, for example, with the archeology. span um, And both of them have schools, uh, high schools, the Germans get involved in a lot of um, institution building and engineering. It's really just so significant. Um, just back to this ethnicity thing, where does ethnicity come from? And it's this language Pashto. The British really kind of continue to map languages in India. The Linguistic Survey of India catches up with Pashto in 1921. It's kind of on the map. And this is really relevant. Uh, for the genealogy of ethnicity, language here. And um, what we have uh, uh, is the language Pashto becoming the uh, thing that somehow the Afghan state uses to drive Pashtunistan, sort of the agenda of Pashtunistan. That is a plebiscite for Pashto speakers in Pakistan to sort of, uh, that would destabilize Pakistan and created a lot of Cold War tension and brought the United States into play, I argue. Um, but this language Pashto, the people Pashtuns and how it's mapped and considered with Afghanistan is much more important. Um, uh, and again, part of theorizing uh, would get us to the end, the, the last British officer kind of on the Afghan frontier, the last governor of the Northwest Frontier Province, Olaf Karo, wrote a book called The Pathans, where he maps um, an ethnographic map of tribal areas. And what we have now is this word tribe and the British compulsion with tribe, tribe, tribe throughout the um, course of British colonialism is slowly giving way to this thing called ethnicity in particularly the Cold War period, 1940s maybe. Um, the concept of ethnicity is starting to replace the concept of tribalism. And we get a kind of ethnographic map. This is also a map from Corot's book, Tribal Locations, Ethnographic Map for Corot. This is inherited um, when the ethnic map of Afghanistan takes shape during the Cold War through the agency of Louis Dupree. And it's very important to kind of position this ethnic map in a larger genealogy of tribal and ethnic and Pashto studies of the British. And Louis Dupree is a very interesting actor um, that has a sort of dual role in the academy and intelligence services and this sort of architecture of Afghanistan studies being um, sort of wrapped up in clandestine activity and in particular anthropology's dilemma um, between being an academic uh, sort of objective science or a political tool in service of things like the human terrain system are raised at this. But the sort of lineage of how Louis Dupree sort of formulated this thing called the ethnic map of Afghanistan that I would argue nothing has done more damage to the people of Afghanistan than the ethnic map. Um, and we need to look at how that was engineered. Dupree 
How he gathered his information for the ethnic map occurred through local informants. Indeed, Ashraf Ghani is one of his informants. Um, Louis Dupree thanks uh, a number of people, including Thomas Barfield, president of the Afghan Studies uh, American thing, uh, for this map. There's a lot of hands in this map, a lot of investment in this map, a lot of political uh, and intellectual investment in this map. And it took shape over stages from 1960, 66 to 73 as the final map when it's published in Louis Dupree's book here, 1973. I've heard a number of things. Um, Louis Dupree referred to as the sort of um, uh, godfather of Afghanistan studies. This book has been called the Bible. And, you know, I would like to sort of challenge both of those things. Okay. I, I think Dupree's book looks a lot like Elphinstone's book. I think it sort of look at the bibliography. I mean, th there's a lot of problems here. Ethnicity is really privileged as the way of understanding Afghan society by Louis Dupree. Um, and we get this map as a really interesting sort of product of, of a lot of institutional and intellectual and political activity during a time when the Americans are actively engaged in the rivers of Afghanistan through the Helmand River Valley Development Project, multi-decades, multi-hundred million dollar investment. Uh, and I sort of um, want to position this now with theories of ethnicity. And Frederick Barth, who's theorizing about ethnicity, goes through Pashto. Let's remember, 1969 is the time when Louis Dupree's map is taking shape. Louis Dupree's sort of intellectual profile, very different than Frederick Barth's profile. Let me say Frederick Barth has made a mark in the discipline of anthropology, in part through this and other work, but his ethnic work is, is you know, still read today, I imagine, in Cambridge classrooms. And this is so important because of the place of the Pashto language and how it is discussed in this book in relation to Baluch, for example, and how this Pashtun and Baluch ethnic boundary, there's a crossing, people can come and uh, go from being a Pashtun or a Baluch. This has a lot of economic and uh, indeed, uh, uh, very interesting issues related to it. But I want to ask the audience um, to ponder the differences between these two individuals' treatment of um, the uh, ethnic group Pashtuns. How Barth theorizes it, how Dupree politicizes it. I find this to be um, very different. They talk past each other, never kind of appeared on stage together uh, that I know of. Um, I, I know them both, met them both, and, you know, very different people, let me say. Um, and, um, you know, Louis Dupree, his, his sort of covert intelligence work with the Mujahideen and the CIA uh, should be well known, but this is a very different view for an anthropologist than Frederick Barth's view. And I think it's really relevant that the sort of uh, period of the 1980s and this covert warfare involved a lot of mapping about Pashtun mobility. This is a CIA map um, uh, from 1979. And uh, this period brings up a lot of interesting environmental issues with landmine use, the importation of donkeys um, for the Mujahideen, and um, the sort of militarization then very quickly, I'll, I'll finish in five minutes, it, with the militarization of ethnicity. Uh, after 9-11, when that ethnic map we just saw take shape through the 70s and 80s, never theorized really so far as uh, generally, gets militarized right after 2001, where uh, kind of ethnic foes and friends and this Pashtun sort of fetish of empire um, really takes some ugly, ugly human turns violent to the detriment. Um, and, and we have to remember that the crypto-colonial factor here, um, Afghans are absorbing these kind of ethnic labels and using them against one another. And, and we've got a real problem here. Um, and I suggest sort of spatiality, thinking about spatial relations is one way to surmount the ethnic uh, conundrum box. Uh, so 
though this, this business of ethnic mapping, the Soviets do it, the Germans do it after uh, World War II, the Americans continue to do it, ever elaborate ethnic maps. You can never have enough ethnic elaboration. Now, um, I wanna be very quick about the impact, the environmental impact for Afghanistan. I wanna emphasize the environmental impact of capitalism and uh, global development. That is the Helmand Valley Development Project and its failed damming, salinization of the soil that led to opium. And then the environmental impact of war, beginning with Tora Bora and the bombing of essentially uh, uh, ruthlessly looking for Osama bin Laden, the depleted uranium in these munitions throughout the 20 year monsoon rain of bombs that fell on Afghanistan, the depleted uranium in these munitions has detrimental effects to the groundwaters, the mother of all bombs, um, devastating effect on the, the ecosystems of Afghanistan. And the militarization of water and canals through these human terrain teams and provincial reconstruction teams, um, all the while, while um, sort of uh, in a sense radiating the environment if depleted uranium like Fallujah um, is, 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 is happening in the same time. The burn pits, the kind of the, the military base presence, Bagram is, is a, is a Two football fields burning 24 seven for a decade. Just toxins, carcinogens in the air, the topsoil, the filth, the, the air. Kabul went from being a pristine, sort of a, a globally renowned pristine environment to the most polluted place on earth before COVID. And so I asked um, for uh, recognition of the environmental impact of war and the, the difficulty in getting uh, acknowledgement through sort of the, the data, the covertization, the special operations that went on in Afghanistan make the data about the war so hard to get at. It's hard to really get at a lot of the military activity and uh, use of armaments. And um, I, I'll just fin finally say um, that this is a, a picture of Nancy Dupree, Louis Dupree's wife. Nancy Dupree has been positioned um, as a number of things, including as the grandmother of Afghanistan. And I, I would like to reject that. The Afghan people do not need Nancy Dupree as their grandmother. My grandmother was a nomad. The Afghan people have their own grandmothers. And, and this kind of imperial conceit um, is something that we need to get far more conscious of. We need to start seeing Afghanistan in the lens of empire far more critically and how empires manipulate identity and create new regimes of circulation. And uh, I'll leave it there with apologies for the um, heavy dose of, of visuals. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, uh, yeah, this is this is exactly what what um, I wanted to hear. So thank you uh, for bringing so many different things uh, on the table. Um, I'll just say one thing, and I think I mentioned this last time when we chatted as well. Uh, you ended with how empires manipulate identity, but I think there is room here to talk about which empires, because I think we tend to think of only the European empires. And I would argue that that is true, that they did manipulate identities and continue to do so. But I think there are other empires and you mentioned lots of them, including the Mughals and the Safavids, and you didn't mention the Mongols, but I'll mention the Mongols. Uh, and before that, I think which have to be understood slightly differently. But anyway, I will not abuse my um, role as chair and I will open up uh, the room for questions and answers. Uh, we have a Zoom audience, so please raise your hands if you have a question with the Zoom button. Uh, and then we have a in-person audience. So I'll give the in-person audience the first um, uh, the first chance to respond. Re uh, Reza, go ahead. Um, and, uh, Professor Hanifi, thank you so much for such a, a great talk and also bringing attention to what basically happening with the colonial studies of this uh, space 
called Afghanistan, and then how basically this um, you can say politics of of knowledge production a sacred you know it can basically victimize people of this region, including many of its scholars. So when I did my own PhD, which I actually am very much on the same line, because when I did my PhD myself on the Arab conquest of or Arab Muslim conquest of of you can say this region. I had a, a serious problem, you know, to understand, you know, what is happening here, how they basically define this space and so on. So, but then um, when we talk about Afghanistan, as you say about this term, which uh, you very um, greatly explained it already, um, we it, uh, probably it's like a box. It never allows us, you know, to go beyond that and then to see this interconnectivities between, you can say, this region and then the region around it, and then of course a global kind of, you know, I mean, aspect of it. But then, um, so this is a, as you say, this is a problem. But then um, also, if we look at the uh, historians of this region itself, right? I mean, people before the colonial era started writing from, you know, long, long time from the, say, um, at least from the ninth century. They really understood this region very well. They knew, you know, the importance of this region as a kind of interconnecting block between, you know, I mean, these regions. They, like, I mean, I can uh, say um, about, for example, the Ali Yaqubi, or for example, Fazail Balkh, you know, talks about it. And also the term Afghanistan, as you said, you know, it comes only from the colonial, you know, I mean, basic things. It's already mentioned in Tariq Hirad of Saifi Hiravi is an Ilkhanic basically historian. So they had a very clear understanding of this region, its people, environment, you can say political organization, and also, you know, I mean, political history. So to decolonize, you know, that, um, you can say that knowledge, which actually imposed on this field, mostly by the colonial on and the imperial studies, can we not, should we not go back to the, you know, to the region itself, to look at the history of itself and see what they say and create a kind of foundation and say, look, I mean, this is an alternative understanding of this region. So if we, because, you know, when we, when we bring the theories, theories bring the problems. And then I always, you know, I mean, argue in, in, in different places that when we apply theories in Afghanistan, these theories come from different contexts. As you said, I mean, environmentally, geographically, politically, it doesn't even match to the situation. So is it, isn't it like a way to look back and then free ourselves from this box called Afghanistan? And then, you know, it's like, look at the historians, the people, you know, who themselves thought about this region in the past. Before you answer, just to, uh, for the audience, uh, those who are not speaking, <laughs> could you please uh, close your microphone because we get a feedback. Uh, uh, then uh, respond, or? No, I think we we let Professor Hanifi respond, and then we'll do the next uh, next question if that's okay. Yes. <clears throat> well, uh, thank you so much for the comments and the insights, and, and indeed the the question. And um, and let me respond by saying, uh, indeed, yes, I do think it's important to um, more actively, thoroughly engage pre-colonial source material to get um, out of the box, so to speak, that you mentioned. Uh, however, those sources themselves open up another sets of boxes, you know, I mean, the, the pre-modern sources, just the sort of Persianate, let's just say literary tradition is itself a really complex one. And, you know, uh, Jews Janey is no simple author and his mobility and the uh, imperial uh, kind of context. Uh, the Mongols, there's, you know, mentioned uh, the context of the Mongols there. So uh, while, yes, I totally agree and uh, concur that the uh, it, it's, it's essential that if we want to get at a uh, closer to an indigenous or uh, and I'm reluctant to use the word authentic, uh, uh, or I'm also reluctant to use the word truthful, or, um, but more firsthand local experiential accounts, I think, are what you're speaking to. I, I totally agree. Um, and I should note that, you know, kind of one of the benefits of, of empire recently, so to speak, is there is um, been some attention to, for example, translating indigenous source material. And again, I think of Machesney's fantastic work in translating uh, Siraj Tawarikh, uh, kind of an 11 volume, the most important work for the modern history of Afghanistan now available in English online. And other work, and you know, uh, I, again, I'm very happy to mention Niall's work with 
this material and his sources. His student, a number of his students have done great with this. Um, but I also would like uh, just very quickly, Rajati mentioned our initial encounter and uh, how we kind of talked about the identity politics. And what I did not mention, what I mentioned in that contest, Prajakti, was the concept of how borders, Afghanistan's borders, first of all, have ethnic groups across them. So for example, the Pashtuns in Afghanistan and Pakistan, Uzbeks in Afghanistan and across, Baluch, et cetera. So the ethnic groups in Afghanistan have co-ethnic brethren across the, the, the borders in, in most cases. And that fact then leads to the concept of the borders leading kind of structurally to the minoritization, the majority ma minority um, relations that we were speaking of, the, the role of borders in the making of minorities on either side of the border uh, is what we were so uh, joyfully discussing back, back when we met. And I, I think that's worth the audience uh, sort of thinking on. Yes, that, thank you, thank you for clarifying that. Yes, I think I, I think my only uh, uh, my only caveat there was that when we think of borders, they are slightly different in the nation state era, and then they're different in empire era, and then different in a nomadic or at least a Turkic uh, Persianate uh, empire that you were talking about. Um, so the, yes. the borders yes. don't mean as much uh, between the Khanates and. Uh, they mean something, but they don't mean the same thing as they do eventually with the nation state or in the in the in the era of the British colonizers and the and the czarist ones. So that that's that's the only thing I was I was um, referring to. Uh, but but I shut up. Um, uh, hey, he wants to respond. Yes, please. If you want to say something, you can just well, I, I just fully concur that the sort of um, the sort of theorizing about the border or the frontier or the periphery, you know, Afghanistan is not, there's not been enough of that, yeah. you know, despite the sort of focus on the borders, there's not been a theorizing of the borders, how they affect mobility or something like that. So I, yeah. I'll chip, in, I'll chip in if just a bit, we'll come back later for a bigger, just for this particular point. So uh, there has been some theorization, I mean, uh, uh, well, Magnus is one. <laughs> uh, I've never written anything, but the way I theorize is uh, in the following way that borders, we again project our notion of sovereignty as constructed today. So we have so the borders when they are within a empire or even within a sovereignty, still minoritized, but they, they bring different uh, agencies or take away different agencies. So when they become international borders, it's a different thing. Then it doesn't stop minoritizing, whether within a country you can have borders and, and that makes people the same. They live across the borders and they become minority within that state, but that the level of the overarching sovereignty that doesn't affect so much. But, 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 but then we have an entire different set of tools to look at when they go across. So the, the, the way to test this kind of notion has been very interesting uh, case, two cases. I think there are many more, but probably, sorry, they're not many more. The two ones, one is Central Asia, where you have people becoming a, either a minority or a migrant or a foreigner without actually moving at all. So the speed of speciality, the, the notion of space is very interesting here because you are a Kyrgyz living, where you have always lived, but on one side you are a minority, other side you're not, and you're a citizen of a different country. So the idea of oh, the, the, the traditional space and time, think, uh, idea of minorities and migration can be actually put to side and look at cases in Central Asia. And other one is, of course, uh, Balkans, uh, former Yugoslavia. Those are two very interesting cases that to think about, where we have both at our, you know, the post-Soviet one and the post-Yugoslav world to look at different contexts, uh, religious mixes there. They are, they are again interacting with very similar, how to say, things above and below and around them and so on. So, so that there is there is some thought there, but but that's a longer uh, separate discussion. <laughs> yeah, I I uh, just really appreciate that, and um, what it what strikes me is how um, the concept of zomia 
is also another one where these um, questions of groups, uh, mobile groups engaging different states and sort of the discussion about how appropriate the concept of Zomia yeah. that Scott developed for sort of Southeast Asia, mm -hmm. you know, works for Central Himalayas. There's just been yeah. another interesting set of uh, Sarah Schneiderman, the anthropologist has worked on sort of a, the, I think Thimpu people who move between Nepal, mm -hmm. Bhutan and Tibet and yeah. sort of have different strategies of identity making and place making in each location. Yeah. Uh, just wonderful stuff. Thank you very much. Yes. Yeah. Um, thank you. Okay, we'll bring in the Zoom audience and then I'll use all my chance or something. Uh, Janet, do you want to unmute yourself? Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Sorry. Yeah, it's an uh, excellent presentation. Uh, Dr. Hanifi, I have a question uh, regarding water resources. Water resources is very complicated in Central Asia. And in Afghanistan is building huge canal now to get water from Amur Darya. It looks like it's very identical to uh, another project which was developed by Russian in Central Asia, Karakum Canal, and which it's uh, destroyed, killed Aral Lake. So it's very outdated technology. It looks like very identical, those uh, two methodologies, how uh, Russian built in Central Asia, in desert region, and it's very inefficient technology, huge evaporation, a huge seepage of water. And it looks like in Afghanistan, they're using exactly the same methodology. Just it, it will have huge water losses, huge seepage, huge evaporation, up to 100% of water will, will simply disappear. And uh, my question is, uh, will it be interesting for you to develop some kind of comparison studies, uh, how uh, uh, Russian built uh, old Karakum Canal in, in Turkmenistan, and what's going on now in Afghanistan? I'm just looking for <laughs> maybe uh, partners to study. Uh, I am from Central Asia, from Kazakhstan. It's quite interesting what might happen here, yeah, what's going on in Afghanistan now, and what was before in uh, former Soviet Union time, and maybe a couple of researchers we may join together, and uh, it will be a very interesting uh, research. I think it, it could be very important also for this region. What do you think about this idea? First of all, delegation you. just arrived <laughs> in Kabul just now as we speak with engineers. Uh, from where, excuse me? Uzbekistan. Uh, I'm from yeah. Kazakhstan, Central Asia, Kazakhstan. No, no, no. I'm, I'm saying something else that the Uzbek delegation has just arrived I'm to discuss the canal. Oh, <laughs> just now as we speak, they have landed this morning uh, and uh, oh. and they have at least four water engineers with them in the delegation. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Very good. Very good. Yes. Yeah, maybe they will join also. <laughs> yeah, we can discuss. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Well, well, thank you, first of all, um, for the question and the uh, sort of uh, opportunity or invitation to collaborate, which I, um, in my personal capacity, accept. And now we just have to build institutional capacity around yeah. our individual initiatives, you know? And I'm happy uh, and eager and have indeed uh, been in my own way in touch with uh, uh, people in Afghanistan uh, who are concerned with water. And th th there is a, a recognition for uh, work and uh, an awareness of the problems of, of the Northern Canal. Um, so I think there is, there is potential. And I think it's great to hear that the current Taliban government are communicating with uh, uh, the Uzbeks in this case about, about the transnational bound, trans water boundary issues, trans boundary water issues. Fantas and yes, indeed, I do think that the uh, history of sort of irrigation in Afghanistan can benefit from a comparative analysis with the Soviet period. Uh, the, I also in sort of was thinking of the Fergana Canal um, as, as one that uh, could have been similar to the uh, this northern Oxus uh, canal of the Taliban for manual labor use as opposed to machine labor. Um, and I'm not, I don't know about the sciences that sort of are behind the canal digging, but I do think that there's uh, a need for shared knowledge about this uh, in uh, across the national boundaries for sure. So, 
let's keep in touch. Please send me an email. I hope you can find my email. And yeah, I, I'll I, it. yeah really look forward to our communication, how, okay. however, however it ensues. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, um, thank you for that. Uh, Zalmai, go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, Shah Mahmoud, it's very nice to see you at least virtually after such was, a long time. It's been great. I, I remember our last encounter with great fondness and um, I just heard Magnus's name mentioned. And of course, that's a Cambridge degree and uh, stands apart from everything I've, I've said critically. So I would not basically repeat what Do Dr. Reza Husseini mentioned, uh, but um, I mean, all of those, what he said applies to what I wanted to say. But with an addition that um, you have beautifully come to the conclusion that the ethnicization of basically the theoritization of ethnicity by Barth and then uh, politicization of it by Louis Dupree and later on militarization of it uh, as the, the consequence of it for Afghanistan, you basically it was excellent implications of the studies that you, you're doing. But then coming to the point that don't you want to also look at the um, model of the nation state that the Afghan state has adopted uh, as, as a result of all of these? For perhaps before that, you mentioned Faiz Ahmad and the way he celebrates the um, issue of how ideas migrated from, from the Middle East, uh, namely from uh, Ottoman Empire and then the later Turkish Republic to Afghanistan, but then the model of the nation state adopted earlier in Afghanistan, which is the um, uh, a model, the, the current model of Turkey, for example, Turkicization of um, every inhabitant of Turkey, which has failed. And still you have the, uh, uh, the, the Kurdish minorities in, in Turkey that are fighting you know, the PKK war, warfare. So uh, in a diverse, but at least they have a, few hundred years of you know tradition of Ottoman Empire behind them and and the literature the literature in, in Turkish and all of that but in Afghanistan an ethno uh, ethnic group which is a minority itself i.e the Pashtuns um, adopting uh, at the same uh, basically uh, assimilationist model in Afghanistan and expecting others to become Afghan is not the, the problem also as, as an implication for yourself. Also the, I was, when you were talking, I was looking at the map that um, helpfully um, uh, uh, Dr. Saxena was showing to me, the issue of language is very important. If you look at the current status of Afghanistan, I mean, always we talk about knowledge and the production of knowledge, but, but we are not looking at what is Afghanistan now and the ethnic communities and, and religious communities that live in Afghanistan or the mosaic of Afghanistan and how that can be reflected into realities of politics and everyday life is a big question, but also the issue of language. The, the overwhelming majority of the, the people of Afghanistan speak Persian. Um, so if that's the case, still the, the states, the states basically in um, denial of multiculturalism, denial of, um, you know, the uh, language issue and impose, imposition of a certain identity on the rest. Isn't you think of a big problem and emphasizing is still on Afghanization. And then you're still, you're saying that celebrating perhaps the possibility of Afghanizing Babur as well. So I think we, there might be a need for us to, to step back and even think about the state project as well of denial of diversity, denial of pluralism and all of that. And perhaps look at other uh, available uh, you know, um, models of nation state, which are possibly adaptable to the context of Afghanistan. Uh, that that will say that I will try to end with the, you know, the comment that you made about the work of McChesney, translating um, books and stuff and celebrating them. The only problem with that is that this colonial knowledge that has been produced in Afghanistan, some of them have assumed those, the books that has been translated, but what um, Dr. Reza Husseini was mentioning that it is better to focus on texts that they have not based, have a presupposition of accepting such a uh, model of nation state, which is not uh, suitable for the diversity of Afghanistan. Thank you. Yes, well, 
uh, tell me, thank you for those comments. And it, it is really great to see you virtually. Um, if I recall, our, our last conversation was right along these lines before we, we said goodbye. So it's nice to pick up where we left off. And um, yes, I cannot uh, but agree entirely that there has not been enough uh, rethinking or theorizing the state models, the model of the nation state, the sort of constitution of the Afghan state itself and how state practices and policies um, somehow impede the expression of minorities. And again, language is the issue here. So let's uh, I'll maybe take this in two ways, one from the state side and then second from the language side. And um, you tell me if I've not responded uh, to something, okay? So first with reference to the state, um, it, I, I would like to draw a distinction between uh, empires and states and Ahmad Shah Durrani's resource base and his empire and for example, that of his son, very different uh, sort of, let's say 18th century to 19th century, okay? And here now, the structure of the Afghan state becomes very heavily dependent on the spatiality and resources of British India. And so the structure of the state called Afghanistan, we can look at Abdurrahman's time, take shape sort of then, the borders, the fiscal architecture, the kind of internal colonialism, suppression of not just, not just the uh, Hazara, uh, Jot for, I would say, more religious than ethnic purposes. That's a lot more Shia and Sunni than Pashtun and Azara dynamics there for Abdurrahman. Abdurrahman's religious consciousness, I think, um, outweighed his ethnic consciousness and, con you know, the way Nuristan, what happened to Kafiristan, Nuristan, uh, again, more kind of religious logics of, of colonization and, and, and inclusion coercive inclusion. And you know, the, 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 what group in Afghanistan did not suffer at the hands of, of Abdurrahman? I mean, the sort of suppression of the Ghilzai rebellion. My grandfather was born in Samarkand because my great grandfather was exiled by Abdurrahman. People remember this and the structure of the state uh, you know, um, the resources, the violence, the borders, the administration, the taxes, the conscription takes shape then. W what sort of um, gets intensified with independence, that is Amanullah, the constitution, the sort of failure of that, the Nadir Shah, uh, of course, the so-called interregnum of Habibullah Kalakani, Bache Saka. Um, you know, what, what happens in the state structure at this context, um, it's, it's sort of a different scale of, of state penetration where all international actors, the Ottomans, Indians, are sort of involved in state making. It's, the out, it's sort of the neoliberal outsourcing of, of public state institutions and services that's happening here. Theoretically, this looks to me like crypto colonialism which is a phrase, a, a concept that Michael Hertzfeld, the anthropologist has used for understanding state dynamics, mainly in kind of Thailand and Greece that are not fully colonized. The point is that Afghanistan is like Thailand because it's not fully colonized, but yet kind of in the colonial orbit such that the elites in Afghanistan, the elites in Kabul begin to adopt models of state that come from the outside whether it's the British or the German or the French. And those models of state, those performances, the clothes, the institutions, the development, the creation of Buskashi of all things as a, as a kind of national sport, Turkic horses, inventing the Atan as a Pashtun dance. And you know, all of these state making agendas um, are, you know, again, a national anthem that sounds like the Barber of Seville. 
I mean, all, this is crypto colonialism. And so, yes, I do think we should look at the architecture, the infrastructure, um, and do the archaeology of the Afghan state structure in a much more serious way. I, I concur. And I would like to look at agency within the state structure, Afghan and non-Afghan agency. I'd like to look at overt and covert agency. And, you know, this is not just about Afghanistan when it comes to state-based activities there. I mean, we have a whole global regime of detention and torture that is taking shape here through Afghanistan and state practices there and sort of the legalities, the, the, the legal architecture that allows these things. Um, it's a part of the state structure here. And, you know, extradition agreements. And, you know, I, I don't know the complexities of states. I, I, I tend, you know, again, we've got this really sort of interesting problem where Afghanistan is seen as this nearly stateless, state, 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 state. state. And, and yet, and, got, got, you know, yeah. up here talking about the, the, the state, which is okay, but I, I uh, just wanna make sure that we don't overstate the role of state here. It's a cobble centered project. It involves generally a very few uh, sort of urban elites um, proportionally. And, you know, uh, about language. Well, um, the most important thing, if I'm, for example, I'm not allowed, I mean, if, if I was in Afghanistan, and I was in Afghanistan from 2014 to 2021, for example, the state is so, um, conscious of the identity that if I was to question any time in Afghanistan, the identity Afghanness, because this is a re not representation of a fair representation of all the mosaic, you know, uh, communities of Afghanistan, you will be chided, you basically, you know, that this is an imposition, at least we have to acknowledge this, you know, as, as scholars, and accept that this imposition has gone too far by the state. Well, I think the, the, the sort of so-called identity politics has really thrown open a debate about this relationship between Afghan Pashtun, Afghan and others. And like the re people are rejecting, um, you know, uh, the uh, sort of Afghanistan, not Afghan, Afghanistani, Afghan Hareji, sort of the, 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 the the modifications of, of the concept of Afghan is also a part of what's going on here, right? And But linguistically, there's a very important relationship um, here um, between the languages in question, that is between the, what is a sort of well-established classical literary tradition of Persian that the state structure, and let's be very clear that the state structure has run on Persian historically. Of course, there has been a presence of Pashto in translations, for example, now routinely in Persian and Pashto as a matter of state policy in the, you know, kind of 20 year uh, period. But really the history of the Afghan state is of the Persian language and Persian literary production. And that's very important to, to embrace. And when it comes to the um, translation of no, no. Mishadni, huh? No, sorry, we are, we are uh, managing our audience, but yeah. <laughs> go ahead. Yeah, I, and I, I, I'm sure I can be uh, this. Yes, could, yes, yes. We, we have another, of we have other people asking the question. Just that the state tried to replace Persian with Pashto for 10 years, all the institutions of Afghanistan. But one that what the Taliban are now doing is similar to that, is also we shouldn't forget. Okay. Um, but but uh, uh, Professor Nafi, don't respond yet. Let's take another question. Uh, Mr. Tripathi has been waiting for a long time. So uh, please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, good afternoon, Professor Hanifi. Good to see you face to face. Thank you so much. Nice uh, to you, sir. I, um, you probably know that um, I have had an interest in Afghanistan for 50 years. The first 25 years were driven by journalism as a BBC correspondent, 
uh, in Afghanistan and elsewhere. And uh, the last 25 years or so, uh, I've been interested in academia. But my interest on Afghanistan is, first of, first of all, thank you very much for a very extensive survey of Afghanistan, very enlightening and many, many things I did not know. Um, but my focus is quite narrow. And uh, because of my uh, career in journalism and more recently my writings, uh, I place Afghanistan in the context of geopolitics of modern times. And my understanding, uh, the way I have tried to understand Afghan society and structure it in my own mind, and I, I would like your reaction to it, um, modern Afghanistan, its structure, I've tried to understand it which in ways that I will put in three, four bullet points uh, to be brief. First of all, Afghanistan, as you have alluded very extensively, um, has many, many influences uh, and invasions. Most recently, Soviet, um, American, and of course, much older um, invasions from time to time um, of various kinds in small ways. Well, certainly pressures from Pakistan. Uh, so um, Afghanistan, first of all, needs, uh, my first bullet point is that uh, Afghanistan has been influenced by foreign influences and invasions, uh, which have created or fueled divisions in Afghanistan. Uh, and different influences um, have been met by people settling in certain areas, linguistic groups. Um, if we like to use ethnic groups, but that is confusing because <laughs> Uh, from my own experience, people speak several languages, same people. So that is confusing. The other contradiction is I talk about settlements based on the nearest influence uh, that, that came from. Um, Afghans are nomads. So, so they are not settled in one place. Uh, they move and then they go back. But there is an instinct to go back to where they were. Um, number three is that Afghans, because of extreme scarcity in the modern sense, uh, want foreign help. And external forces take advantage of it. Uh, but once they have had foreign help, they don't want dictates. There is an instinct in, in Afghans not to be dictated by foreign powers. And that has resulted in many, many wars. And number four is that Afghans um, like to go back to their own ways in the end. They, in the absence of modern and developed uh, state institutions, um, which have failed Afghanistan from time to time, um, they they really want to live their own lives in their own ways. So they, they like to go back. Is there any merit in the way I have tried to understand this structure of Afghan society? Well, uh, first of all, uh, Mr. Chavati, it's such a great pleasure to see you in person. Um, and and th thank you for attending and thank you for this question uh, and for your you know, careers work on Afghanistan. Um, and for blurbing, I think my Elphinstone book. So th th thank you for many reasons. Um, well, let me uh, say, first of all, yes, they're, they're with reference to ethnicity and language, I think that's precisely the point that tying an ethnic group to a language as in Pashto, for Pashtuns is entirely misleading due to the multilinguality and the sort of diglossia, how when 
the context for which language is used, Persian or Pashto in this case, is just absolutely critical. And um, it is that very bilingualism or linguistic hybridity that destabilizes the concept of ethnicity in, in really fundamental ways. And um, I, I, I just think if we look at the structure of the so-called generic Afghan family, it's a generally the extended unit has a multilingual dimension to it. And, you know, for example, in my family's case, Pashto, the language of the house, but Persian used for when there was a marriage and an incomer came in and then Persian to facilitate that incomers for Persian became the language of the house to facilitate the incoming bride. And so, it, I mean, the, how, how these languages and identities play out uh, in terms of ethnicity, I think there's great complications and you draw attention to them so usefully. Now, the question of settlement versus nomadism, um, uh, and your reference to sort of going back and that nomads in a sense have, have territory that they call their home. And that's a place where their family may be settled while one part of the family migrates. And the relationship between mobility and settlements across kinship units, tribal units, ethnic units, is absolutely critical to understanding the mosaic and landscape. So once again, um, I entirely concur um, the only quibble would be the tendency um, to uh, kind of go back and sort of this, this sort of sense that the culture is looking back to a homeland or looking back to tribal territories or back to the stuff. They're, they're sort of that, that can limit the sense of a futureness that Afghans are not trapped in the past. They are actually responsive and dynamic and can change, change languages, change locality. And so um, I, I, I would only caution that retrospective historical consciousness does not limit sort of futurity and possibilities for the future that animate us all, okay? Um, finally, I really appreciate your uh, reference to the concept of scarcity and uh, dependency. And uh, it, it, you didn't use the word dependency, I don't think, but I am imposing it on your phraseology. And this is so important to, for understanding uh, bo both cultural sensibilities about aid or hospitality or donations or whatever the case may be, charity. Or, but more importantly, the politics of local resource management. And historically, um, for example, um, and again, maybe my first book talks about this, the extent of the fruit, dried fruit and nut trade. Let's just say food in general that Afghanistan has exported for millennia. And I'm talking about all kinds of uh, fruits and, 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 and nuts and uh, not to mention meat in the form of, of, of sheep and et cetera. But Afghanistan is a food exporter um, to India, the Mughal court, for example, for, for centuries, if not millennia. And what I ask when it comes to the uh, sort of food supply, Afghanistan food supply, is where did our food go? How is it that we are now a famine-ridden, food-importing, uh, external food-dependent nation? We used to feed South Asia. Now we're dependent on food. Where did our food go? And what are the, who is responsible for that? And I will look to Afghan leaders as well as the international aid system and the sort of imperial militarism and all of that sort of wrapping humanitarianism into, into destruction, bomb and then rebuild, kill and then save. I mean, the, that, that is a problem that has to, has to cease for Afghanistan. Um, but this uh, 
question of scarcity, I, I would just like to sort of rhetor respond rhetorically and say, how is it that we went from an exporter to importer of food, for example? Um, and I don't have the answer to that yet, but it would require some, um, so, some attention to the nature of, of the state. So th thank you for so many reasons, Mr. Tripathi. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I'm just, I think Montu wants to say something and then we'll wrap up. Um, yes, we're, yeah. we're done out of time in sense, but there, there are so many different things to note. And I think we almost like a, another session on these things, but I wanted to just note a couple of things. Uh, uh, one was just coming from the, the current discussion about scarcity and so on but but in general the role of whole new liberal uh, sort of construction of of uh, on one side the notion of state uh, the, the westphalian notion of state uh, and and how that's purposed in a number of different ways so idea of a mother tongue or monolingual linguality that is attached to the statehood is to me a, a very neoliberal formula because it then it enables consumption which is over capacity or produced elsewhere in, in, in mass quantities. And that's a pathway to that consumption pattern that comes with that political, how to say, uh, framework. Um, the, uh, and that in general also uh, has a, a major uh, sort of impact on the, uh, uh, how we think about the, mm, the overall idea of knowledge production. About. So fundamentally, the, the, the two small things, so for example, well, rather one, let's just keep it to one. So large chunk of discussion that we had about knowledge production regarding Afghanistan is still based in Anglo-Saxon context of language, i.e. English, but perhaps a little, little bit of other European languages. But certainly, the then we flip to the classical uh, accounts of classical Persian or Arabic or Turkic, but we do not pay attention at all to what's happening in current day vernaculars, as well as languages in which Afghanistan is talked about, discussed and felt and experienced. And I mean here, uh, you know, uh, uh, you can talk about Russian and, and Russian, not only as of Russia, uh, but Russian as is spoken and used in Central Asia, uh, similarly, uh, Persian itself, uh, uh, for instance, uh, the encounter, so often when I try to articulate myself in Persian in Central Asia, uh, the immediate focus looking at my, my uh, persona and my accent, they imagine that I'm Afghan. And, and you flip between where you are, uh, between uh, the whole uh, the Persian speaking Central Asia, I can be called a Hamvatan or Ham Zaban. Either way, it, it, it changes across. And, the, and there is a lot of discussion both among people, uh, how you think and relate to Afghanistan. Uh, and the, uh, but also for that matter in Pakistan, in China, in Chinese, how are people writing about it? It has certain reflections. They're not always only the ones how we have the, the, all the discussion we had. So that space is completely out of the purview of academic thing which believes that it's only one doing it and it, it's only one solving its own problems right so there are other uh, how to say constituencies which are dealing with it and i think that requires a whole different discussion i mean i think uh, discussion got lost with what uh, zalmay was saying about nation and so on but even in in, in turkish <laughs> uh, just just the turkey's own production about what it thinks and we again immediately stop only at the the security dimension of it but there's a lot of cultural discussion, just simple everyday news media, how they talk about things, what words they use, what they choose, how they describe the situation, uh, especially I think most recent tragic discussion regarding the sympathy about the earthquake that happened and how that was expressed and talked about in multiple languages and different relationships and how things happen is the kind of thing we don't map because <laughs> first of all, it's difficult. <laughs> Secondly, but, but more importantly, it's not part of how we plan our research. Uh, and that's something we need to look at. So I'll just stop there. <laughs> yeah, well, th thank you for those observations that really center the concept of experience and the experience of the Afghan people and how they mediate the state through their own linguistic capacity. And with reference to language, the, the key thing that was not 
explicitly addressed in our discussions with Salma and others is the difference between sort of literacy and orality. And, you know, there's that very critical distinction that Persian as a, as a classical literary language and Pashto still is, as it's a largely, largely strategically oral vernacular um, language. Um, right, well, well, and again, uh, the, the other uh, frame, I'll just say the situationalness of, of identity that you elevate certain aspects of your identity depending on context and that's Frederick Barth. That's yeah. Patrick Barth's theory of, of situational ethnicity as opposed to kind of primordial ethnicity mm -hmm. practice based. Uh, I mean, I would, I would say that the, the overall space, I mean, from Central Asia down to Southeast Asia, uh, uh, the idea of mother tongue is something novel and, and unusual uh, because uh, uh, everybody speaks many, many languages, as you said, in different situations. But also uh, the, the other aspect that we say, so it's a very Western or Northern uh, notion to say that somebody speaks multiple languages, they are very well educated. The fact that everybody in Bazaar and everybody in the streets speaks three or four languages all across Asia, uh, people who have no literacy per se, but have multiple sure, languages sure. they converse in, uh, it's, it's, yeah. it's again lopsided in how we analyze that. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. And I think all of this speaks to sort of um, decentering uh, state-based epistemologies for understanding Afghanistan, really. Yeah. So, um, all right, yeah. <laughs> time for taking time out and waking up very early in the morning <laughs> to come and give us this talk. Um, I think I'll just I'll just say one last thing. Um, I, I'm I I, mean, I know you covered a lot of territory, but I think that showed the expanse of the different or alternative visions of speciality and how we can understand Afghanistan. So uh, thank you for doing that. Um, you touched on so many different things and, and really there are so many different categories that we can look at Afghanistan from and understand where it actually might belong or where it might think it might want to belong um, and how that then can be translated into a modern understanding of Afghanistan. So for our younger audience, uh, students here, who may have gotten lost with some of the history, uh, this is this is the point that um, it is important to look at the historical trajectory of where and what we're looking at. And, and I think um, I think that was that was what my takeaway will be for my students uh, today. So thank you so much for doing that. And thank you for um, giving the talk. Thank you so much for the chance to put some thoughts together and share them with you. I'm grateful for the opportunity. And we, we have the video and if with your permission, we can put it on our YouTube channel. Uh, if you, if you please, approve. Please, yeah, please, yeah, yeah okay. and I'll send it around to my friends who have woken up now. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you to the audience. Uh, thank you for a great discussion. And um, we'll see you next week. And I'll thank uh, Professor Anipi. Right? Uh, yeah. Sorry. So we're not meeting next week. We're meeting the week after. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, I'll send an email out and, and we'll see some of you then. Thank you. Thank you, host and audience. Thank you. Uh, tributes are coming. <laughs> <laughs>